Asgard University to live up to its stated values of free speech and rigorous debate. The University of Chicago Popular University in Gaza is in fact the best embodiment of these values that I've witnessed in my 14 years here as a faculty member. As you know if you visited the encampment, the Popular University is above all a place of learning. It has its own library, named in honor of the Palestinian poet Rafat al who was killed in December. There are multiple teach-ins occurring every day. University community members are going there to learn about the horrifying events unfolding every day in Gaza. And in fact, as a result of this encampment, I see more students and faculty conversing in a deep way and working together than I ever have before. Numerous of my faculty colleagues have commented that they feel they are learning more from our students than we can possibly ever teach them. And I think the most important things the students have to say is although the story of the student encampments has become the nation's leading news story, the students really want us to focus on what's happening in Gaza and the fact that right now, today, it looks like an Israeli ground invasion of Rafa is needed. I think that their message needs to be heard. The Free University is also succeeding in reaching out across its broader community. It is drawing neighbors from Hyde Park and across the city who are engaging in conversations about how the destruction in Gaza is related to underinvestment and police violence on the south side of Chicago. Since the first day of the encampment, the university has threatened it with violent dispersal on the charge that it violates university statutes that bar disruptive behavior. But I, in fact, the genius of this encampment is that it is not truly disruptive to the university's operations in any meaningful way. It is outdoors, it's orderly and peaceful, and as I said, it is an integral part of our learning environment. Use your outside voice. <laughs> of course, it is true that not everyone likes the message that students have for us, and not everyone wants to hear it. But discomfort is not the same as disruption. And in fact, the university itself has celebrated discomfort as part of learning and free expression. I watched with horror over the past few weeks as militarized police and even SWAT teams have dispersed peaceful protests and beaten students and faculty onlookers. One historian colleague at, a, at another university is so badly injured from this violence that he now needs surgery. And I'm here today because I'm terrified that something similar may happen here. I implore our president and our university leaders to come back to the bargaining table in good faith and to listen to our smart and courageous students and learn what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hillis. <coughs> My name is Elha Mareshki. And I'm an assistant instructional professor in the college and the divinity school. I'm going to echo much of what my colleagues have already said, this time with more of an outside voice <laughs> has been asked of us. This student effort has included a daily schedule of guest lectures, teach-ins, musical performances, beautiful religious ceremonies of multiple faiths including prayers led by Christian, Jewish, and Muslim community members, and an on-site library. This was and is an educational and political endeavor protected by the First Amendment. It should be especially safeguarded at UChicago, an institution dedicated to the free and open exchange of ideas. In, honor, in order to honor the university's long-standing commitment to free expression <coughs> outlined in the Kelvin Report. Administrators have an obligation to allow for continued peaceful protest. Students have been productively engaging in negotiations with the university over the last week, while the university <coughs> has continued in bad faith to escalate by repeatedly threatening police action. As faculty members, we will protect the safety of our students if the administration attempts to violently remove them, even if that means arrest and detention. A crackdown against our students at the popular university for Gaza and the right to free expression and protest the ongoing Israeli genocide of Palestinians would be indefensible. We will continue to speak forcefully in their defense and in the defense of the millions in Gaza experiencing mass 
starvation, dislocation, and death. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anton Ford. I'm an associate professor in the philosophy department and a member of the university faculty council. Um, faculty for Justice in Palestine is a group of more than 120 faculty at the University of Chicago. We are united by our horror at the calamity unfolding in Gaza and by our solidarity with the Palestinian people who for the last six months have been mercilessly attacked by the Israeli army. The same solidarity with the people of Gaza unites the peaceful protesters who have camped here on the Quad for the last seven days. These are nonviolent protesters and they are our students. We call on President Oliver Santos to find an alternative to police violence and to continue negotiating. Moreover, importantly, we support the protesters' central demand that the university divest its endowment and that it suspend its formal cooperation with Israeli institutions. We reject the exceptionalist proposition that the university should maintain institutional neutrality. Even the Calvin Report makes room for exceptional moments when the university's ownership of property, including its financial investments, might have to be reassessed because they are incompatible with, quote, paramount social values. In its well-documented finding, the International Court of Justice has found that it is plausible that Israel is in the middle of committing a genocide of the Palestinian people right now. Genocide is incompatible with paramount social values. We reject as untrue the university's claim that a peaceful encampment of students is an intolerable, intolerable disruption of campus life. What little disruption there has been is a trivial inconvenience which is insignificant by comparison to the good of permitting our students to peacefully express their sincere political commitments and by comparison to the evil of violent police action. President Alavis Santos has boasted that more than 90 other universities across the country have adopted this university's position on freedom of expression. One of the first universities to adopt the so-called Chicago Principles was Columbia. The most recent was Emory. At both of those universities, in recent weeks, there's been brutal repression of student and faculty protesters. When all of this is over, the University of Chicago will have to answer for its principles. Is what happened at Columbia and at Emory what the Chicago principles look like in practice? Faculty at this university are worried about how President Ali Bizatos proposes to answer that question. Our most immediate concern is for the well-being of our students. We don't want them getting beat up just because they're camping on the lawn. Because we expected a raid last night, dozens of us were here, the majority came prepared to be arrested with our students. Faculty for Justice in Palestine will continue to stand with them. Thank you, Anton. Thank you all for being here. My name is Ali Reza Dustar. I am Associate Professor of Islamic Studies at the Anthropology of Religion at the Divinity School, and I also what? direct I also direct the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. We stand here today because we find ourselves at a profoundly anti-Palestinian university. I am not speaking about the faculty. All you need to do is look around you at my colleagues here or spend some time speaking to the many other faculty and staff at the university who are speaking up and organizing against an ongoing genocide. Nor am I speaking about the student population. Just look at the Gaza Solidarity Encampment and how it has grown and thrived over the past week. 
I am speaking about the university's structure of finances and partnerships, as well as its leadership. Our university's partnerships are anti-Palestinian. We engage in research collaborations with Israeli institutions whose products serve the Israeli military-industrial complex. I will give you just one example. We host the Chicago Quantum Exchange, meant to facilitate collaborative research into quantum computing technology with, among others, the Wiseman Institute of Technology and the Technion in Israel. The Chicago Quantum Exchange facilitates the transfer of research to corporate partners like Boeing, whose weaponry is being used on Palestinians today. UChicago has also been invested in funds like Sequoia Capital, the Deerfield Group, and Greenbrier that invest in Aerotech, which makes tactical training simulations and drone batteries currently being used by Israel. They have also been invested in Armis, a company that markets quote-unquote Israeli-made and tested cybersecurity software designed by former members of Israeli Defense Forces Unit A200, which is engaged in AI-based assassinations of entire Palestinian families. These are just a few of our university's partnerships and investments that sustain the Israeli occupation, apartheid, and genocide against Palestinians. But there is more. You Chicago's administrators, and above all, President Paul Alavisatos, have also shown, through both actions and inactions, to be anti-Palestinian. In February, as the International Court of Justice heard South Africa's genocide case against Israel, President Alavisatos welcomed an Israeli consul general to campus and stood for a photo op with him. Despite repeated claims to political neutrality, our president has never, not once, met with a Palestinian delegation. Indeed, our president seems reluctant even to utter the word Palestine. Nor has he been willing to acknowledge that hundreds of his peers, our peers, faculty, students, and administrators have been slaughtered in Gaza since October 7th. President Alavisatos has proven unwilling even to accept, never mind condemning, the indisputable fact that every single Palestinian university in Gaza has been bombed and partially or completely destroyed. So if we are here to support our students' uh, demands for disclosure, divestment, and repair, it is because we faculty believe that our university our institutional and intellectual home is complicit in heinous crimes against the Palestinian people. As we stand here, the Israeli military is forcibly displacing Palestinians once again, this time from Rafah. The horrors we have witnessed in the past six months may pale in comparison to what is still to come. Our complicity as a university needs to end, and we will do everything in our power to end it. Thank you.
restore possibilities for education, for career, for movement. You cannot imprison generations of people and starve them and expect that they become peaceful citizens. The third reason I'm here is that 20 years ago, I was a student in Iran, and I was fighting for what I thought are the moral stand. And the Islamic government of Iran was tracking down peaceful student protests at the pretext of security. So every single thing that I hear here remind me of the same thing that I heard in Islamic Republic of Iran. <laughs> so I came here to live in a country where I can not expect the students to be beaten up when they're expressing their, um, their ideas peacefully. And look at this encampment. The university is constantly throwing money at causes for engagement with Southside and the neighborhood. The community that these students have built is stronger than anything that university's money has created. I'm here to support it for the, the right of these children, the kids, and the kids in Gaza for a peaceful future. Thank you. You both made the point about the uh, universities being bombed. Uh, we've seen a lot of evidence as both Islamic Jihad and Hamas have been using the universities as firing points and for weapon storage. So don't they bear some responsibility in the universities being hit? I think international law is very clear. Militaries do not attack civilian targets. But when there's firing from those civilian International targets. law is very clear. You do not attack military targets. You do not attack civilian targets. Hospitals have been targeted. Universities have been targeted. Schools have been targeted. Refugee camps have been targeted. And the Israeli and Israeli claims that these are harboring military, that these are harboring uh, 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 tunnels, that they are harboring weapons, have repeatedly proven false. So I think. Any claim that comes from the Israeli government has to be investigated by neutral international observers and not taken at face value. But all of that being said, uh, civilian targets are off limits, and I think that should not be disputable. Well, I was in, in the 
Please come up. Can you come up to the mic? Um, I was in the negotiation room yesterday with the administration before they decided to suspend um, those negotiations. They made it very clear that midnight was the deadline for the removal of the encampment, that they um, promised not to um, remove it before midnight. They didn't make clear whether they would do so after. The university has a history of arresting students and faculty. In fact, just in November, a peaceful sit in in Rosenwald was disturbed by the police. Um, and all uh, and two faculty and 26 students were um, uh, charged with criminal uh, trespass in the place where they live and uh, where they work and study. Um, and the university refused to drop those charges uh, uh, afterwards, despite enormous pressure from the university. So this is not it is not um, out of line with what we've seen the university do over the last few months to expect that they will be used by the force against our students. So that deadline was midnight. And you're a faculty member who's in the room. I am a faculty member who's in the room, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Comparative Human Development. My name is Iman Abdel Hadi, C M A N A B D E L H A O I. Follow up. We're tracking other schools who have canceled commencement ceremonies, and we're a month out, but it's set to be right here. Are you hearing any conversations about those plans being impacted yet? We have not heard anything about those plans. I think it's. Um, it's frankly absurd that uh, universities are canceling their commencement addresses in fear of a few students doing innocuous things like saying free Palestine or holding up a sign uh, or wearing the tabia around their necks. Um, it really speaks to the incredible fragility of this of this system that that is seen as a as a as a major. Can I ask you to bring first of all? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since you were inside this negotiation, what's the <coughs> does end up with closing uh, what you're investing in funded companies. What's the end goal then? Well, I think that this is a step in a long, the, the idea is to create a step in a long process towards better accountability uh, for not just this university, but other institutions that are complicit in um, military excursions across uh, uh, overseas. Um, so I, I think I think the end goal. I, I don't think that this the end, this negotiation is necessarily the end. Um, but I think that the students were negotiating in good faith, and I think the administration was negotiating and suddenly suspended talks when um, students felt that we were pretty close uh, to an end, and most of the requests were around accountability measures to ensure that the things that were on offer would actually be um, uh, followed through and would. Be uh, open to community oversight. I didn't follow up on that. I mean, these are the major companies that you're talking about that not only are involved in this conflict, but others. Do you see students and faculty being involved in other uh, protests, of, like for other conflicts outside of this? Yes, in fact, I think that this divestment campaign is a follow up on a broader divestment campaign, for example, from fossil fuels. Um, it's the students have been very clear that they don't want investment in any weapons regardless of where the weapons are being used and on whom they're being used. Um, so I do think this is consistent with a broader set of values and broader activism at the university and other places that hasn't received as much attention um, from the press or the public, but has been around for decades. Um, your presence here and your support for the students, does that mean that they are not you know, being penalized for being here and not being in class? Are they being able to, are they able to remotely learn? I believe students have been attending classes. Um, uh, and um, I, I think that we are very concerned that the university will take punitive measures against our students as they did after the uh, sit-in at Rosenwald Hall. The university administration itself complained about the students to itself uh, at Rosenwald. So the university has a uh, system, a disruption policy that is triggered by complaints. Um, the deans on call, a, a system in the university that is in charge of the well-being of our students, issued the complaint and then a different part of the administration beholden to the same people went through and enacted those disciplinary measures. Um, uh, so we actually have no confidence at all that our students, students will not face punitive measures for their uh, enactment here. By the way, the university only, you know, that sit-in lasted all day and there were people coming in and out. Um, the university pulled the records of who would face disciplinary hearings by pulling police records. Um, so by pulling the arrest records, and then um, uh, serving those people with a disciplinary 
uh, disruption mode. So the university has a history of acting extremely punitively against free speech and protest. Um, and uh, you know, we hope that the university does not enact these same, these same punitive measures um, against our students for their encampment, but we will be placing a lot of pressure to ensure that doesn't happen. Is that why a lot of students are covering their faces and they don't want to be seen on camera? Or is that That's why? in part the, the case, but it's also that Palestinian and pro-Palestinian students um, have been facing intensive doxing and harassment um, for their participation in activism across the last, not just the last seven months, this has been a, a, a tactic that um, uh, that pro-Israel um, groups have used, which is to publish students' um, uh, names, their addresses, their home phone numbers, um, and to engage in mass online harassment campaigns against them uh, to try to make sure that they're not employable, that they can't ever find an apartment. Um, this is a very well-established tactic. If you have an hour and want to get really angry, look up Canary Mission uh, as an organization um, that that literally uh, spends all of its time doing this. And so students have been masking at protests to protect themselves from the, this intensive harassment. And I know somebody said you were prepared to get arrested alongside student protests. Are you still intending to do that? Are you afraid of your jobs? No matter where, when the if the university brings police against our students, we will be there. Are you afraid of your job? When a genocide is happening, extreme measures are um, are under. You know, we're no we're no more afraid of our for our jobs than people in Gaza are afraid to, to lose their tent that has replaced their home that replaced their other home. So I think that our our fear pales in comparison. That's John Hendren with the House. Here, that this is a, an institution that prides itself on free speech and ethical values, and that these students are being punished for exercising those values. And is it because the uh, the people they're supporting are Palestinians? Absolutely, there is an irony here. The university hides behind the idea of political neutrality, but the the university was not politically neutral when it came to Ukraine. It was not, you know, it very quickly mobilized resources to support, rightly so, to support Ukrainian students, to support Ukrainian scholars. It um, created all this infrastructure for the people that were affected by the Ukrainian conflict, right? Um, and any pro-Ukrainian sentiment was, was was celebrated and encouraged. Um, that's just one example of, of instances in which the university has been open to free speech so long it, as it is not about Palestine. Now this is a broader issue. This is not just this university. The Palestine exception is a well-documented exception to free speech in American society, which is to say that you can basically speak about anything unless it is Palestine. Um, and so yes, it is incredibly ironic, especially for this place, um, to, to have these uh, draconian measures and to frankly have these racist, um, this racist exception. As a Palestinian faculty member, I'm the only Palestinian faculty member, in fact, and um, and it, and it's it, there was never a check-in on my safety or or my well-being or how my family is doing. The university has been very clear that those things don't matter. I don't know if 
you have described, uh, a few of you described the disruptions to education as minor. Do the protesters have a right to disrupt anyone's education at all? Yeah, sorry, I actually didn't get your name or organization. Mike Tobin, Fox News Channel. Okay, um, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I think that um, this protest is disruptive. Every massive protest movement in, the, in American history has deployed disruption to great effect. Civil rights protests were, were disruptive. Protests against South African apartheid were disruptive. Um, I think the students have actually worked very hard to minimize these disruptions. And they are, if you zoom out to the University of Chicago's campus, you will see that this is actually a teeny tiny part of um, the, this, these vast grounds that we have here. Um, but yeah, disruption is a part of protest. And so I think this, this speaks to the sort of irony we were speaking about earlier, is that you can't say you're pro-protest and pro-free speech and crack down on any disruption, no matter how minor. Um, because that effectively means that you're anti-free speech and you're Thank you. We're going to wrap up now. Thank you. And those who say that they are ready for a violent encounter and that there are wood planks with nails on them. Do we have any other?